When his daughter disappears, a desperate father turns to a psychic for answers. She's passed. The psychic tells him she's already dead. My mind just didn't want to accept it. But detectives are skeptical. As a detective, I have to look at hard, plain facts. But as her visions begin to ring true, they bring a warning. I really feel panic. I feel Same guy that killed Stacy is gonna kill again. Can the psychic lead police to a killer before it's too late? <laughs> July twenty second, nineteen ninety two. In Tempe, Arizona, a suburb of Phoenix. College student Stacy Hendrickson disappears from her apartment without a trace. She was just 21. For her father back home in Ohio, it's the worst thing he can imagine. I never ever thought I'd have to face this kind of thing in my life. My mind just didn't want to accept it. And then finally when it hit me, I just, like I say, my knees buckled and I just fell in the chair. In Arizona, Stacy was going to college, away from home for the first time. A compassionate, caring young woman, Stacy was training to help children with diabetes, a condition she herself suffered from. If she's still alive, her disease may be her worst enemy. There's a time element involved, and it's very serious. She's probably got approximately 48 hours before she'd uh, go into insulin coma. Tempe, Arizona detective Alan Reed is placed in charge of the investigation. He begins at her apartment, where she was last seen. We knew that Stacy was missing and that she was diabetic, and I found inside the refrigerator um, her uh, insulin, which she needed to take. And we thought that she would have taken that with her if she had gone voluntarily with someone. But it was obvious that there had been some type of force used as we had two uh, forced open doors. Stacy's roommate, Virginia, was at her mother's the night Stacy disappeared. She provides a list of friends for police to talk to. Reed hopes one of them will know where Stacy is. But back in Ohio, 2,000 miles from the investigation, Stacy's father can't just sit back and wait. A neighbor convinces him to talk to a psychic. Hi, I'm Raleigh. Hi, Neil. I felt some desperation in his voice that kind of made me um, realize that whether he was skeptical or not, he was at wit's end. Gail St. John claims she can see and feel things that most of us cannot. Her gift has helped to find other missing children. Maybe she could find Stacy. When I started looking at Stacy's picture, and I was just kind of, you know, just picking up vibrations between looking at the picture and feeling Raleigh, and just kind of, and all of a sudden, just, um, it was so fast, Stacy was next to me. And I kind of took Raleigh's hand and said to him, I have to tell you something. Stacy's gone. And I just kind of a lump in my throat. And uh, she starts describing an area. I'm seeing this building that's. Saying that there's a small building about probably 12 by 14. But this building was like a corrugated metal, which struck me as really odd because it really can. And then a fence around it, which I, I kept looking, thinking, what? This doesn't make sense. This isn't like I would picture a building myself. And uh, seeing the large equipment, you know, it moved dirt, and, and that's not something you see sitting everywhere. I asked her, I said, that when she was describing this building, I said, is she in this building? She goes, no. She says she's very close by. And then she said, there's water real close by. What does it all mean? Could Stacy be showing Gail where to find her body? Then I looked down, straight down, and the dirt was cracked. And I had never seen anything like this before. And um, I was trying to, you know, describe all the things that I saw where she was. And I'm trying to walk like a trail. 
She was like in her own little world, but if she wasn't in no trance, she just basically was walking around the room and just talking. I started thinking that she's actually right there. But Gail St. John is picking up more than just visions. Along with voice and showing me pictures, of, she was impressing with feelings uh, of things that, you know, happened. Uh, and, and it first started out with the, the burning, hot burning sensation I felt in, in the back of my head. And from there, um, I could feel something with the wrist and I felt pain. It was almost a, a, a very like rope or something around the wrist and like a, it really felt that hot burning when it went into me. I actually saw everything just go black around me. Gail believes Stacy was murdered, bound and shot in the back of the head. But there's a lot of things you try not to go into as far as those details. Whether she was real, it was an act, whether I, having the skepticism that I had, you know, and being 2,000 miles away or 1,800 miles away, I, I just didn't know. I couldn't say it was for real or it wasn't at that point in time. Later, later on, that's a different story, but right then, I... Back in Tempe, Arizona, Detective Reed's investigation continues. He has few leads, but forensics have unearthed one important clue. Whoever forced their way into Stacy's apartment left fingerprints behind. Maybe someone in Stacy's apartment complex saw something. Have you heard anything unusual in the last uh, several hours? No, I haven't. Reed gets lucky. Stacy's neighbor across the hall witnessed the break-in. Pushing on the door and banging on the door. Who was this mysterious intruder? Did he kill Stacy as the psychic believes? The disappearance of a 21-year-old college student in Tempe, Arizona, sends a desperate father to a psychic. But what she sees, he doesn't want to hear. She tells him his daughter is already dead. But police believe Stacy Hendrickson has been abducted and could still be alive. Now they've found a witness who could lead them to Stacy. He hears the sound of steps coming up to the second floor apartment. And as he is uh, awake, he hears some pounding on the door. So he looks through the peephole, and he sees this young white male, approximately 25 years old, banging on the door. He's banging on it, and there's no answer or anything. So finally, he tries forcing open the door with his shoulder, with his, with his hands, and then does a little drop kick, and then makes entry. What concerned me is, the neighbor doesn't call the police. Told me that it was his opinion that this was a boyfriend-girlfriend dispute. Uh, he didn't want to get involved. He told me that he, he went back to bed and, and heard nothing further. So he really had no other information that was helpful. Other than he told me that the person that entered was a white male, uh, clean-cut looking, and was wearing a very distinctive black T-shirt. And he said that this black shirt had on it a skull. In Ohio, Roland is desperate to find out anything about his daughter, so he calls Detective Reed and tells him about Gail St. John and her strange visions. At first, his request falls upon deaf ears. Yeah, I considered psychics and, and stuff that they did. Uh, the word I use is mumbo jumbo. So all I could do at that point was listen close and pass on what she had told me to the detective that was actually there in Arizona and see if he recognized anything I was talking about. As a cop, I have to look at hard, plain facts. And so, as a courtesy, and it was a courtesy to Raleigh, uh, we contacted uh, Gail St. John. Would this be the phone call that would change the course of Detective Reed's investigation? I was so busy, and I was so not wanting to waste my time. I gave uh, Gail's number to a partner that was working this case with me. I asked him to call. I kind of felt the skepticism, but there was a bit of willingness to listen. I've got something to write with. Shane. Gail tells Reed's partner where they'll find Stacy's body. She describes palm trees to the south, a chain link fence, cracked dirt, a small corrugated shed with a slanted roof, 
and then she tells the detective something she hasn't told Roland. Gail believes Stacy was murdered, shot in the back of the head. When I first told him that you're dealing with a murder rather than an abduction, he was kind of uh, hesitant to the point of almost kind of saying, no way. But Detective Reed is not about to turn his missing persons investigation into a homicide based on the word of someone who claims to talk to dead people. The information she had given to us was useless. It didn't lead us anywhere. We couldn't uh, um, put that information out on a police radio or, or even begin to look anywhere. And at this point, we don't even have a body. We don't even have a victim. You know, there is really no convincing someone that you're right or you're wrong, you have to let things fall into place. If I tell you something and then later it happens, then it fell into place, now you understand, you believe. Two days later, after the call, something does happen, something that will change Reed's skepticism forever. A city worker finds a body in a dumpster next to the Tempe Canal. This was just another routine, if you will, death call for me. But as I drove down that canal road, I start to remember, all right, now, Gail said it, it was near water. Well, the canal's full of water. I get out of my police car, and I see palm trees to the south. I look down, and I'm walking on cracked earth. And oh my gosh, I, I see a rolling machine, which is a conveyor belt. And this machine specifically removes debris from the canal as it floats down and places that debris into a dumpster. The hair on the back of my neck was just standing straight up because everything that Gail had told the police, it was like a picture. It couldn't be a better match. When police remove the body, it's so badly decomposed from the hot sun and water that a photo ID is impossible. However, I, I want you to know that uh, even though I could not make a positive ID of her at that point, based on what Gail said, in my heart, I knew that this was Stacy Hendrickson. One other clue convinces Reed the body is Stacy's, something Gail St. John said. And as I picked Stacy's body up, I could see that she had ligature marks on her wrist and that she had been bound. And she was x-rayed and it was apparent from the x-ray that she had been shot in the head. And at that point, I became um, somewhat of a convert to the information and the gift or the ability that Gail St. John had. A hard-boiled detective is now a believer, and with a killer on the loose, he wonders what else Gail St. John knows. Can the psychic really help the cop find Stacy's killer? I can't tell you how astounded I am. Uh, I do have a killer out there, and, and the information you gave us was accurate. I think he, at that point, dropped his skepticism and, and was more open to saying, OK, now I see what you said was right. Where do we go from here? The next day, Stacy's father flies to Arizona to help ID the body of his daughter. He has yet to see how accurate Gail was. I was hoping it wasn't Stacy. That's what my guts was saying. Still waiting for dental records to make a positive ID, Detective Reed shows Roland three earrings that he recovered from the body. I had bought her three diamond studs, and they were they graduated from small to a medium to a little bit bigger. And uh, she was minus an ear on one side, but this ear had these three diamonds in it. And I, that was a very identifying thing to me. Because it had only been a couple months that I'd bought those and she wore them. So yeah, I, I felt that at that point that was definitely Stacy. Detective Reed takes Roland to the bleak spot where his daughter was found. 
when we got there, he was amazed. He was amazed at what he saw. It were really exactly as Gail had said. What really gets to me, I think, is I always told my daughter, if you ever are in a problem and, and you're in need of help, you call dad and, and dad will be there to take care of it. And I drill on that constantly to have to come and, and find your, your daughter or your son in a situation like this where they wind up basically, you know, dumped in a dumpster like garbage. It's, it's pretty hard to take, it just... Once we had recovered Stacy's body, I can't begin to describe the, the pressure then that, that begins. Just as Gail St. John predicted, Detective Reed has a homicide on his hands. Reed now follows up on dozens of leads, but none lead to a suspect. The psychic was right about where Stacy's body would be found and the terrible way in which she died. Can she now lead police to her killer? I saw people divided up into two camps. I had people who said, this is a bunch of baloney. You know, a lady who claims to be psychic or who talks to the dead, that's, that's a bunch of baloney. I had other people in the police department say, Al, you need to listen to this lady. And they would relate personal experiences to me that they have had. So I was encouraged by probably half to, to pursue this avenue with Gail, and the other half were, were, were laughing at me. And there were some people also that, that said, hey, you maybe need to look at her as a, as a suspect. And, and I guess if, if you are someone that give police information about a, a crime, you know, a lot of times that person giving the information is responsible. Days after discovering the body, Reed gets a disturbing yeah. call from Gail. I really feel panic. I feel panic. She says the killer is about to strike yeah. again. Um, the same guy that killed Stacy is going to kill again. Who's he going to kill? She's Gail she's believes his her. next victim will be Stacy's roommate, the girl who was staying with her mother the night Stacy disappeared. Very upset. Um, in Tempe, Arizona, a missing persons case has become a full-scale homicide investigation. Eerily, psychic Gail St. John predicted that 21-year-old Stacy Hendrickson had been murdered days before police found her body. Now Gail is warning police that the killer is about to kill again. She says that Stacy's spirit has told her that the next victim will be her roommate, Virginia. The same guy that killed Stacy is going to kill again. Who's he going to kill? Virginia. I mean, she's real specific. She's t she's talking about the roommate. I'm feeling terrible panic now. Stacy's just going wild here, trying to describe what's happening and what's going to happen. And the roommate's life is in danger. She's going to go see this guy, and she's just going so fast. I'm trying to absorb it, and you know, of course, the detectives. Are you still there? Yeah, but I'm trying to listen to your conversation and hers. And sometimes you feel like you're um, halfway between two worlds. <laughs> I'm not sure of it. I'm not sure of what's going to happen. She's actually telling me that the same person who killed Stacy Hendrickson is going to kill again, and the person is going to be Stacy's roommate. And that's pretty specific. And part of me goes, you know, this is this is pretty outlandish. The other part of me says, you know what? I can't disregard it. Look what happened. Uh, when we went to the scene and found all those things she said. Reed heeds Gail's warning and asks Virginia, Stacy's roommate, to come down to the station. Gail has also told him that Virginia knows the killer and is reluctant to make him a suspect. I tell her that Stacy's father had contacted a lady who has a gift. And uh, this lady we have found to be very accurate and I then tell her the story of how we found Stacy's body. And as I'm talking to Virginia, I'm placing the Polaroids in front of her. And I can tell that she's uh, somewhat disturbed at what I'm saying. And then I look at her in the eyes. And I said, I just got a call from Gail St. John. And she says that the same person who took the life of your friend is going to kill you tonight. And when I said those words, 
the blood drained out of her face. She turned white and she teared up. And I'll never forget, she immediately said to me, check out John, check out John. John Adams is a 26-year-old manager of a local fast food restaurant. Adams met both Stacy and her roommate just a few weeks before Stacy was killed. Incredibly, Virginia has a date with him that very night. With no time to lose, Reed tracks down Adams at his workplace. If Gail is right, this man's prints should match the set left on Stacy's door. He was very cordial and he was uh, very cooperative. He told me that he knew Stacy. He told me that he was dating Virginia. Uh, I saw no sign of emotion from him. I asked him if he could assist me in the investigation by uh, allowing me to take his photograph and also to take a sample of his fingerprints. When I left that restaurant, I was really not confident that that was my killer. Um, he was just way too cool, calm, and collected. Uh, again, uh, my faith was going to be put in, in those fingerprints. Have a good one, though. The prints turn out to be a perfect match, but that's not enough to charge Adams. There's no murder weapon, and nothing as yet that links him to the shooting. And Gail St. John, has she's done her job, and it's now my job to build a factual case of things that people understand in court that I can use to, to put him away. Reed's hard work finally pays off. Adams does own a skull t-shirt that matches the one the neighbor saw the man banging on Stacy's door wearing. Not only that, but it turns out that Adams had recently bought a gun, the same caliber as the murder weapon. Armed with the new evidence, Reed pulls Adams in for questioning. Once again, Gail St. John's eerie predictions are confirmed. So everything is now just adding up. It, it, everything points to John Adams. And I need to convince him to make this right, to tell the truth. Uh, we begin the interview and talking about, really, John. In the back of my mind is a warning that I received from Gail St. John. And she has told me I need to be very careful with him. John is full of rage and anger, but she tells me that he can change from this nice, courteous young man to a raging bull. And I need you to know that uh, John will try to hurt me. And at a certain point in the interview, I could tell that John was ready to talk. John began to weep, and he did tell me at that point that he did kill Stacy Henderson. He did what? I killed Stacy. And I told him that this was a murder and I would have to charge him with a murder. And I did use that emotional word. What happened, I'll never forget, from this very sorrowful, repentant young man who has his head down, his shoulders slumped, his hands clasp, tears streaming down his face, changes uh, in the twinkling of an eye and becomes this raging bull and attacks me. No! No! Again, what Gail St. John had said was true. This man attacked me. John Adams is charged with the murder of Stacy Hendrickson, and he eventually makes a full confession. In court, the final terrible moments of Stacy's last night alive were revealed. On July 22nd at 2 a.m., Adams arrived at Stacy's apartment, fueled on drugs and alcohol. He banged on the door, kicked it in, and chased Stacy into the bedroom. There, he shot her in the back of the head, her pillow muffling the sound of the bullet and the bed sheets catching the spray of blood. Adams then wrapped her body in the blood-stained sheets and dumped the evidence in the Tempe Canal. Days later, it was siphoned from the water and deposited in a dumpster, the exact location described by Gail St. John. I went on to work homicide almost 10 years, and in those 10 years, I never, ever dealt again with someone like Gail St. John. Stacy saved her roommate's life. That's what it boils down to. If she hadn't said it to me, if she hadn't got that across to me, then we would have had another murder. 
In court, Adams pleads guilty to manslaughter and is sentenced to 29 years in jail. I fear you'd have to be a little crazy to do something like that, but I don't know how they feel. What promotes them thoughts to do things like that to some innocent person? After all, she was in her room, in her own bed, sleeping. She wasn't bothering anybody. You know, why?